Hi there and welcome to part one of Love is a Verb, a video series talking about personal relationships and how we can learn from positive psychology and personal relationship and map that onto customer experience to build better connections with all our customers. Coming out of the pandemic, there are some key values that really resonate with everybody in terms of the relationships we have with our, with our partners, with our family, with our friends, with our children, you know, authenticity, vulnerability, connection, truth, honesty, these are all things that, that we really value post-pandemic. And it's brought me to think about how relationships work and how they should work in a business point of view. Because we talk about customer lifetime value and brand loyalty and tribal belonging all the time. But actually, why should a customer be loyal to us? Why should a customer have us in their lives as a brand for their lifetime unless we give them as much as they get from the relationship? So relationship theory I'm going to use here in this series of videos and blogs to actually look at at what we need to do better if we're going to deliver on customer lifetime value. I've abandoned the waistcoats in the usual videos and have gone for braces instead. The set's adorned with love, so let's get into it. Firstly, do you remember your teenage years or maybe even more recently when you had an, an experience of unrequited love? You know, you liked someone, you loved someone, but they didn't love you back. Do you remember the pain, the hopelessness? It's a horrible feeling. But yet I think we do that all the time with our customers. We expect them to give us their love and support in return for a product or service, but why should they? You know, I remember I was 20. Uh, this girl here was a Swedish girl who came to my university for a year. I fell in love with her. She was beautiful. She had a boyfriend back home and I chased her all year. And of course I lost that chase, uh, but I remember the pain. And so I think what we need to do here is we need to understand, well, hang on a second. If we want a, an equal partnership in terms of relationship, then we need to look at the positive psychology tips and attributes that make up a good healthy relationship and then map those onto the customer journey. And at various points in the customer journey, we bring that love to life and that's how we deliver on customer lifetime value. So there's going to be 10 attributes of healthy relationships I'm going to go through over the next two videos. This video has the first five. So on the screen now is the first five that I'm going to go through today. And let's start there at the beginning with love and commitment. So what would a personal relationship be? Think about any of your important personal relationships. Think about the most important person in your life right now. It could be your husband, your wife, your partner, your lover, your friend, your family, your children. Don't care. Think about them. Hold them in your head as I talk about these issues and you really understand why they're important. So what is love and commitment? Well, firstly, commitment and love, we give maximum effort to our relationships. If you're about to jump a jump from rock to rock here on the screen, you have to give this maximum effort if you're going to make it to the other side. You can't kind of half try, you will fail. The same thing in relationships. But do we give maximum effort along our customer journey? I think we do the basics a lot. We get the hygiene factors right, but are we really jumping that gap? Are we really giving maximum effort? It's the first thing. Number second is commitment. What is commitment? Well, commitment is about planning a future together, planning a real future together. Together. It's what you mean when you slide a ring on someone's finger, when you ask them to be with you for, their, for your life. It is about planning a future together. And are we doing that with our customers? I'm not too sure that we are. I think we can do a lot, a lot better. And what we do is we, we measure satisfaction, we measure NPS scores, and that's not the same thing. We talk about customer retention, customer acquisition. Such aggressive words. If that was a Tinder dating profile, I would be saying, would you like to come back to my house and I will lock you in my dungeon in a cage? <laughs> that's what retention and acquisition sound like. You know, we need to be loving and committed to our customer relations and committed to them in a way that holds them with us for the customer lifetime value naturally, not acquired. I mean, look at the, this example from Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's is a US grocery store. They don't deliver. They never have delivered. They didn't even deliver in the pandemic. But once in Pennsylvania, a daughter was panicked. She called loads of supermarkets and restaurants in the area. Her 89-year-old father, a veteran, was trapped in his apartment in the snow. He couldn't get any food. And she was hysterical to get someone to deliver to him. And Trader Joe's did step up. They did deliver, even though they don't even deliver as part of their uh, the service. And not only did that, but they didn't even charge for the groceries. That's a moment of, of love and commitment and commitment and support, I guess, to a customer. And that's what we need to do in our customer journey. So that's number one, love and commitment. You need to ask yourself, what are we doing to show the love and to be committed to our customer? Number two is time, quality time, spending time with the person you love. Time is so important, so precious. Once it's gone, it's lost forever. And so, you know, one of the main problems, imagine if you went on a date and the person on the date was just on their phone all the time opposite you at the table. It wouldn't be really 
very enjoyable with it. And that happens even in our own homes. The pandemic certainly working from home kind of made this a bigger problem for people. You know, a lot of people, even though they're physically together, aren't actually together. So how can we show our, our customers that we support them and that we're there for them and that we want to spend time with them? Think about this, the, path, the fast pass. You know, when you buy a fast pass in the theme park in Euro Disney or Porto Ventura, uh, you do it because you value time. You want to skip that queue and get to the front as soon as you can. Same with the priority boarding queue in an, in an, in an airline. You want to get on board as fast as you can you pay for that service and that's what you want so time is the same and if you think about call centers and contact centers for customers every time you're put on hold if that whole time is longer than two or three minutes you start to get very angry I was on hold for 50 minutes five zero uh, only this week with my corporate bank uh, trying to authenticate a credit card and, and it wouldn't work and they said oh well you have to call us back tomorrow and I say hang on why do I have to call you back so this this idea they don't value my time and that's a big big problem so what are you doing to value your customers time make sure that we don't use up any of their time in any part of the customer journey because that is not a way to show love and support in a relationship okay number three number three is intimacy and the moment I say intimacy you're all thinking oh my god we get to have sex with our customers no so I know physical intimacy cer certainly pops to mind and physical intimacy is really important and post pandemic certainly we all want to touch and hug more and yes massage and sex and touch have been proven to lower blood pressure and uh, lower risk of, of diabetes and heart disease and all those things but there are many types of intimacy and there are emotional mental and spiritual intimacy also so emotional intimacy what is emotional intimacy it is about affirming the customers feelings it's about caring how they're feeling. It's about really, you know, stepping into that space and being empathetic. That's what emotional intimacy is. Then mental intimacy is about having meaningful conversation. It's about having shared interests. And spiritual intimacy is about having shared purpose and respecting their beliefs. And so all those other things, those other ways of being intimate are really valid for customer journey. And in fact, intimacy is defined as fostering a sense of closeness. That's what it's about fostering some sense of closeness with your customer. How intimate can you be with the customer? Great example from United Airlines, this guy called Ker Kerry Drake, Excuse me. He was flying home to try and get to his mother's bedside before she died. You know, that horrible moment. He was flying from San Francisco to Texas via Houston. Unfortunately, his San Francisco flight was delayed outbound. He knew he was going to miss his connection. It was really tight. He was crying on the plane for obvious reasons. And the cabin crew spotted it, asked him what was happening. They realized that if they could help, they would. And that they radioed ahead, the pilot radio ahead, and held the other Texas-bound plane in Houston for another half an hour so that Kerry could make his plane. Now, we know in aviation every minute counts in terms of financial consequence, but here an intimacy was shown to him, and that's the way we build love and support with our customers. Number four, number four is trust. Trust and honesty. What would any relationship be without genuine trust and honesty? But yet, every single time we make our customers feel less than they should, and we don't necessarily show that trust. Think about an insurance company. Every time you renew your insurance, you have to call around, you have to try and get a better premium, you get a better premium, you call your insurance back, and they say, oh, okay, we lower it. They were ripping you off, and now you don't feel trustworthy. How about the bank that has a dormant bank account? They charge you $10 or 10 euros every year for this dormant bank account that you're not using. Could they not just contact you and say, look, We've been charging this for five years. Do you want to shut this down? How about utility companies that have you on a broadband or electricity uh, package that isn't suiting your needs, that actually is higher than what you need and you're using less than you should be paying for? And why don't they call you? Why don't they call you and say, hey, look, there's a better package that suits your needs. These are all moments of dishonesty. Let me give you a great example. I was performing in Sydney once and I was on a beach walk from Bondi Beach around the corner to the next beach. It was hot, I'd forgotten to buy water. So I called into this cafe and ordered myself a made to order smoothie. I went to pay for it as I was drinking the smoothie and they didn't take cash. I had no cash on me. I had been in Sydney only for a day. I was leaving the next day. I only carry plastic when I'm traveling. And Jenny's cafe said, look, you know what? Just catch us the next time. I said, no, I'm sorry. I don't live in Sydney. I live in Ireland, the other side of the world. And she said, look, okay, well, the next time you're in town, come and pay for your smoothie. And I laughed at the element of trust. But you know what? But nine or ten months later, I was back in Sydney for another show, and I did make it my business, of course, to visit Jenny's Cafe and pay for her smoothie. She thought it was hilarious. She didn't remember me, but she thought that was hilarious. And of course, now it's a tradition. Every time I will be in Sydney, I will make it my, my business to go to Jenny's Cafe and order a smoothie. Trust builds relationships. Really, really important. And the last one I want to talk about today is communication. What would any relationship be without good, successful, healthy communication? And communication isn't just about talking, by the way. Even though in communication, we talk about marketing communications all the time. It's not marketing communications. It's a megaphone. We just shout at our customers. And even in the new world, the new channels, social media, we still just shout at them via sponsored ads, non-contextual messaging. 
what we need to do is learn to have a conversation. It's a conversational economy we live in today. But not only about communication, as I said, it's talking, it's about listening. And we talk about active listening in personal relationship. And if you're yet to kind of come to what active listening really is, listening is just hearing, but active listening is as they talk, saying, well, what does that mean for them? Empathizing, trying to see it from their perspective, not getting defensive, and trying to genuinely help the issue that's being talked about. That's active listening, and we need to do that much, much better in our customer experiences. You know, we really need to understand that. Look at these ones, and also we can get communication really wrong. Amtrak, look at here, their Monday motivation quote, as the, as the customer says, not great for a train company, is it? Or one of my favorites from Virgin, you can have some fun with brand communication too. Here's this guy tweeting from his carriage that there's no toilet paper. He's done a reasonable large poo my favorite word there reasonably and I love the idea that some guy in the UK somewhere is getting these tweets and is calling this train to say you know you need to go to coach Jay to deliver some toilet paper to a guy stuck in the toilet so communications all about you can have fun with it but it's got to be authentic it's got to be genuine it's got to be real so those five things there love and commitment quality time with the person you love intimacy trust and honesty and communication. If you can just get those five things and activate those along the customer journey, not all of them at all times, but pick a point where each one of them makes sense, activate those, you will create a deeper relationship with your consumer and you will have more success in building customer lifetime value. Tune back to the second part of this blog and video series to learn about the next five. Until then, I'm Ken Hughes with my braces. See you then.